Hi everyone, we're back for one last shot at the Dream Eaters, and that is the Weaver of the Cosmos scenario 4B, the end of our Web of Dreams campaign. Hi Super Fang, how are you? Good, how are you doing? Not bad. I'm looking forward to wrapping up this one and kind of dump all of my Dream Eaters vents and thoughts of <laughs> at you and, and the viewers <laughs> at the end of this, but um, I, this one's like at least interesting mechanically to mm -hmm. have a lot to talk about how it works and what are some things that go well and what are some things that don't go well. So let's get right into it with uh, what we usually do is just what happened in the previous, uh, what happened for the setup and what all the stuff that happened previously uh, comes back to, to haunt us. Yeah. Look at that paragraph of story text. One paragraph, the good old days. Mm hmm. <laughs> Um, well, we are here, right? We've gone down the sea of pitch, and uh, we find ourselves in this blacky void, and uh, we gotta descend down the great web. So, we are gonna do some setup. We gather some encounter sets, and we put four of these locations called the great web uh, randomly out in play in a line. So we're gonna do that right now, and uh, we'll see what happens. There's fifteen and, uh, of them. That's so many. I know. I wonder why we only need four of them. Hmm. All right, we put some stuff aside. And lastly, we check the number of tally marks recorded next to steps of the bridge. As you recall, that's the bad stuff that happened in the last scenario. Um, every damage on the scenario card, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, as well as potentially some stuff in the first one. Uh, for the more you get, the more doom you will place at the bottommost location. So you can see the range is there. If you had two or fewer, you've done very, very well. That's very impressive. So no, nothing on the bottom. Um, how much do you think you usually get to? I think I'm around either one or two doom. Yeah. Okay. So let's remind ourselves what the numbers should be. So you, if you full clear the first one without having yeah. to do anything, you get no steps to the bridge, right? Yes. And then it's just the number of damage tokens at the end of the previous one. Correct. And the limit of that one is five, because once you get to five is when you have to early out the scenario. Right. So I find, again, I find this campaign to be pretty swingy. Like either I've got a boatload <laughs> or it's like three. Right. Exactly. That sounds about right. So, All yeah, right. I've seen it like with nine to 11 for sure or 12. Like if you, if, wow. you, if you screw up the first one, right, it's it's eight. Already. Yep. So, yep. There and, you go. You screw both. That's your, well, you're, you're in trouble. Right. Because, like, that means that you already started with some damage counters at the beginning of the previous one, right. too. Yep. So, it just sort of compounds, and then it's very likely you have four Doom on the bottom most location. That's right. All right. Well, with that in mind, that is our setup. And uh, much like uh, the other one, <laughs> I can't remember the name of the scenario now. Um, what was it called? Oh, my God. Where the Gods Dwell? Where the gods dwell, thank you. Yeah. Uh, there's a little bit of a beginning kind of interlude-y uh, part of the scenario before we get to the quote-unquote real meat. So mm -hmm. um, in this beginning part, uh, we'll start with our agenda. And our, our agenda is fairly straightforward. Um, we are back in the Forgotten Age, it would seem. And uh, we have an agenda doom threshold, which is modified by the number of players. So it's currently 7 plus 2 per player. So say 2 player, that's 7 plus 4. That would be 11 doom threshold. Mm -hmm. And it also has the text, like in Forgotten Age, where when the agenda advances, you don't remove Doom from locations in play. Uh, that should be uh, reminiscent of some other scenarios in that campaign. So one thing to note with that whole you start with Doom on that bottommost location is, yeah, the more Doom that you start with there, the more that this compounds into future uh, agendas. Absolutely. All right, our act... Got some text about locations connecting above and below. And we need to get three per clues at the bottommost location. Everyone needs to be there. And uh, we can advance from there. Okay. All right. Let's Pretty check simple, out. straightforward beginning. Let's check out these locations. Now, they are random, so we don't know what they all are, but they should have clues or some way to get clues. So Hopefully. All right. We got the Tangled Web. Two shroud, two per clues. Forced when the investigation ends, if there is at least one investigator at this location, place a doom on this location. Okay, so now you've seen the main conceit of this scenario, well, for now anyway, uh, which is doom on the agenda, on locations, and 
ending on locations or entering locations where extra doom gets placed. So when we look at all the locations, they most of them have something to do with this. And uh, yeah, it'll get worse. Yeah, you got to be very uh, tactical with uh, your movements and your actions. Which I like, but ultimately because a lot of these locations, well, all of them, I guess, are going to be unrevealed, the tactics are sometimes, well... <laughs> <laughs> You got to eat the doom. I will say, uh, starting like without spoilers. I mean, I mean, I don't know. We're reviewing the scenario, so the spoilers. Yep. I always feel like there's a lot of doom, like a lot of time in this scenario. So I never found it too big of an issue, uh, but certainly it can spiral out of control if it goes bad. So well, that's the thing. Like, it, it, I, maybe it's just the way that I've had this scenario and the campaign go. But either it's kind of a cakewalk and there's tons of ter uh, time. Yeah. Or the doom basically makes it so it's impossible <laughs> because, you know, again, you're trying to prevent that, right? So, uh, again, the doom that's down here, there's nothing you can do about because it's just there from the beginning of the scenario. But, yeah, we're going to remove these top three locations from place. So these don't actually matter too much, but you want to be able to get down to the bottom before you end up uh, advancing that first agenda. So, I don't know. The first part, I don't think it matters so much, but... Later, it'll be a bigger threat. Absolutely. All right, we got the vast web. It's an as an action. If it is not Act One, oh, okay. Well, this is a blank then. Yep. <laughs> Let's read it anyway. Sure. If it is not Act One, and there are one per clues or fewer clues on this location, sorry, move, move to the location directly across from this location. Okay, that makes zero sense. Nope. I don't understand that part. Nope. <laughs> what else? We I got? guess we'll ignore that. The cosmic web. Forced. After you enter this location, test their willpower. If you fail, you must either choose and discard a card from your hand for each point you fail by, or place a doom on this location. Very importantly, you either discard a card for each point you fail by, or you place one doom. That's regardless of how much you fail by. Mm -hmm. uh, so, that's kind of hard to run choice. into at the beginning, right? Yep. But a lot of people entering there. Everyone's gonna have to go there. So that's right. Exactly. Yep. Last one. All right, let's let's see what our last one is. Ooh, the web stairs. Well, it starts in play with a doom on it when it's revealed. <laughs> that's Nothing terrible about for that. this one. <laughs> yeah, that's an extra one on top of the ones that were already there. <laughs> well, yep. okay. All right. So, so given so... that we need three per clues, this is actually a pretty tough opener, if I'll say so myself. Yeah, because yeah. you don't so want to get... stay here. No. You can get two per from here easy. Yeah. I probably get these one per because everyone's gonna have to go here anyway. Mm -hmm. Probably where that would probably be my strats for this. But. And this one having five shroud is uh, pretty rough. Yeah, yep. But of course, right. you don't know that, right? <laughs> exactly. That's all. That's always the thing. You have to kind of like, uh, kind of take your guesses with how you go down the web. Yeah, at least for this one, since you don't all move at once, someone might scout ahead and, and go here and then say, yep. well. Now we know, get the clues on your way down. Exactly. Movement tech in this one is huge. It is indeed. Alrighty, so let us advance. It's the edge of dreams and we have reached our scenario interlude portion of the day. Mm -hmm. Just like last time. <laughs> yes. Okay, so let us get there. Spider Queen, Spider Queen 1. Hey, there's a lot of sticky webs going on. And, uh, well, what happens? First of all, if Randolph survived and the Black Cat knows the truth. So as a reminder, the Black Cat knowing the truth was one of the requirements in order to get the secret scenario ending for uh, Where the Gods Dwell. Mm -hmm. In this case, it is revealed, aha, Randolph is not Randolph here either. No. He's never been here. Where is he? I don't know. Did he even exist? I don't know. Maybe not. Maybe not. Anyway, so uh, we have uh, been... We are... Well, actually, we're not trapped, right? Because the cat knows the truth. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to get rid of Randall Carter. Um, but otherwise, uh, we would skip to Spider Queen 4. Uh, Spider Queen 3 is if the cat did not know the truth, but Randall did survive. He betrays us. We are trapped in that lock, Naka's realm. And we also get a bad chaos token. So for standard, it'd be another minus 4. Again, I actually think that's better than not because you're uh, diluting the bag a little bit more. <laughs> I guess that is true. From the autofail uh, and from oh, what, what 
this one that there's the elder thing that's bad. I think so. Yeah. I remember that being. Yeah. 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 All right. And Spider Queen 4 is, of course, the setup. This is by far one of the coolest things I've ever done. We are going to first remove all the locations except for the bottom one mm -hmm. from the game, meaning that all the doom on them also goes away. Yep. Very important. Uh, we are going to put this on top. How many do we need? Seven. <laughs> we need uh, seven more. Yeah. So uh, if I recall, it's, I mean, it's just a, it's just a square, right? Yep. And we also need Athlock Naka. And I think this mod has a very nice place button. There it is. There sure is. Pops out. Giant spider with five cards. Yeah. Crazy. It's so cool. This is, I mean, yes. yeah, I'll zoom in a little more so you can see the whole thing it is so cool that they did this and have like the upside down uh, help and, you know, everything. Yeah. It, it It's neat. And it is very neat. You are you feel like you're on this web with the spider in the middle. And then, as we'll see in a second, we have this thing where it spins around. Yes. I just want to do this real quick. Do, 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 do. Yeah. Oh, okay. it's, it's hard to do it very quickly. <laughs> okay, that was, I think I need to do a five or something. Yep. There we go. So okay. it's considered to be like the corners are touching, basically. Yeah, so that's where those enemies are. So um, in, the, in this orientation, this would be touching that one. Yep. This would be that one. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah, this is a super creative way to use cards in this game, and I love it. And then the middle part is just there for a nice, pretty picture to connect to all the others, right? Indeed. Yeah, okay. Yep. Oh, yeah, and it explains the rules here. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're going to shuffle in some other cards as well into the encounter deck, and we'll see those later on. Mm -hmm. That's what it should look like. All right, well, that is our Act 2. Our new objective, we got to deal... We got to defeat some legs of Athlock Naka. So, as an action, you can spend a clue and deal three damage to an ancient one enemy at your location. All the legs are ancient ones. Mm -hmm. And forced when the mythos phase begins. Very important. So, before Doom happens and before you draw any cards, reveal a random token from the Chaos Bag. If its modifier is negative, spin Athlock Naka clockwise X times. X is the token's negative modifier. So I guess adding that minus four does help if you want to spin it four times. Um, yeah. So I find at this point it doesn't. It, it it matters. It sort of matters, but not that much. Like I think you can usually catch up to. So you can only deal damage or uh, try to fight it would set your location. So if you like get rid of this one, then you have to keep like moving around a clockwise fashion. But then you don't know if it's going to spin out of your way yeah. um and part of what is difficult <clears throat> in this scenario is what you do with your investigators do they all kind of clump together or do they spread out and lower player counts of course you don't have much choice uh but yeah in some turns you're like i'm about to kill this thing and then it moves four locations away you're like well <laughs> i'll wait for it to come around again yeah uh, and but uh usually yeah. you draw you know minus one or zero and nothing happens right uh, but yeah uh, shall we le read the legs? Yeah. All right, so they are an X fight, three per investigator health, and three evade ancient one spider elite enemy. They are massive. This enemy cannot make attacks opportunity, so that's nice. X is the shroud of this enemy's location, and forced. When you would evade this enemy, instead of exhausting it, choose an investigator at your location. This enemy cannot attack the chosen investigator that round. So an evade for kind of only one person. Yep. They all have victory one and deal one and one. And the fact that they don't make attacks opportunity is huge because yep. that ability here does not uh nope. provoke enough top power. It's not, top a, top not a parlay. <laughs> yeah. Otherwise it, it would. So so it's it good would. that you could do that. Um they're all the same, right? Correct. Okay. Well, that is this part of the scenario. Let's look at the other locations, maybe. Let's do it. Go clockwise, I guess. Prison of Cocoons. Four shroud, one per forest. After you enter this location, test three agility. If you fail, you must either lose an action for each point you failed by, or place a doom on this location. That one's a lot worse than the willpower one, in my opinion. Yes. Yes, it is. And the other reason why is because you usually have a plan of what you're doing when you're moving to these locations. You're moving in to try to kill one of these enemies or a different enemy that we'll see that's probably the scariest enemy in the campaign and uh you know losing actions in order to accomplish that is bad yep all right next we got the web woven island only one shroud one precludes 
as an additional cost to investigate this location, you must either spend an action or place a doom on this location. Tough choice there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good to have some other ways to get clues other than investigating, but it's kind of easy to get clues here. So you want to investigate. You want to save those like drawn to the flames for the five shroud location instead. <laughs> so. Yep. All right. We've already seen the tangled web. This one's mm -hmm. a little bit a little bit easier to deal with on this side since you can, in theory, have people move in and out of this location and not end here. Mm -hmm. uh, but it can be awkward sometimes if like an Athlaknaka leg is like here and there, for example. Yeah. So. All right. Fast web. Hey, it's that thing again. So yes, now we're not in Act 1. You can move directly to that location. Huge. Huge. And that no penalty good one. otherwise. That's, yeah, that's actually a pretty good one. Good placement, I think, for this, mm -hmm. this one. Uh, I found that if you don't get, so there's two great webs, I think. If you don't get either of them in the second half, it's a lot harder. Mm, like a interesting. lot harder. Not just because like sense. the move is helpful, but there's no penalty for staying here, for entering yeah. here. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, yeah, that's that's okay. This All right, one another one of these web over islands. Mm -hmm. Another web stairs, another doom out. And another prison of cocoons. Wow, we dodged a couple of them. So there should be four left remaining. Mm -hmm. We can go through these now. So we have another cosmic web, which is the willpower test. Mm -hmm. Another another web stairs. So there's three of those. And a third web over an island. And a third tangled web as well. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so this is random. And sometimes you get like back to back, uh, like the web stairs or something. There's three of them, as you can see. And you yep. weren't expecting that. And then you've got these five shroud locations. That's pretty tough. Um, you know, it's a finale. They're, they're trying to kill you. Indeed. <laughs> what are your thoughts on locations here in general? Yeah. So it might be that I've gotten. Um fairly lucky with them. I mean, I've played this a few times, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, but I haven't really found them to be that debilitating. Maybe because I've been erring on the side of it's okay to put Doom down more often than not, especially if you're, like, going to lose your whole turn. Or if you're, like, you know, I mean, for this one, it's like, you know, if you only have one action remaining, even if you fail by a bunch, you can choose to lose an, uh, an action for each where you fail by because mm -hmm. that changes the game state. So it's like, yeah, I had one action, it's fine. Um, Obviously, if you enter here in your last action, you're like, oh, I got to put the Doom down. Um, but yeah, I mean, otherwise, because I also think that um, the encounter deck, like, isn't crazy in this one. Uh, there's maybe one or two exceptions, but like, it isn't crazy. So it feels like I always have a lot of time. But as you say, I do think that this one can be pretty swingy. Um, and that's a fairly, it can get pretty out of hand. I remember a number of times like it's just not uncommon where you are like okay we're here don't want to end our turn here don't want to have the zoom and then you move to the next location which is unrevealed and then you get this one you're like ha ha sure. very funny <laughs> right i mean but that one was going to get revealed at any point right? yes yes that's true. and also and ultimately like in my opinion a lot of this doom stuff is like if you're going to spend your whole term trying to avoid getting one doom mm -hmm. just put a doom down and do your own thing because that was worth it anyway right yes yes uh it's just a question of like it do, does the doom matter in any individual turn and right usually it doesn't that like you said the threshold is pretty high what ends up mattering is uh, towards the end, if you didn't actually have that much yes. time, you look back and say, well, uh, you know, you can't keep making those decisions every time to put the Doom down. Yes, and I think that part of it also is that, you know, having a very good fighter to be able to deal with the legs efficiently without having to have the Seekers spend the clues to, mm -hmm. to actually kill them is very important in this scenario because if the fighter is, because, you know, three per health is not nothing, but it's also not a lot if you think about it. Like, in two-player, a fighter should be able to deal six damage in like two actions, maybe three mm -hmm. at this point in a campaign. So for sure. And I think the clues don't do anything other than uh, deal damage. So it's, it's helpful, uh, yeah. but you probably don't have to move around that much except for to get to the legs. Exactly. So what are your thoughts on this whole spend a clue, deal three damage? Because there's a lot of discourse about like, is this a little bit much? Or is it kind of necessary for this scenario? Question. Um, I think that it definitely, like, so I think the reason that I don't have an issue with it is because uh, 
this beginning part of the weaver of the the weaver and chaos or whatever mm -hmm. is quote unquote the easy part <laughs> right and i will appreciate anything that gets me to the second phase fast enough uh because the second phase is 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 definitely harder mm -hmm. um and so like in this specific scenario it helps get us through this first phase quickly if that makes any sense yeah i i think i agree like initially when i saw that i was like it, it falls into the trope of like seekers do everything and better than the fighters do but i think indeed for this scenario it's kind of there to get you three through more quickly yeah uh, i honestly actually think that the enemies other than the legs are more important to deal with yeah so i'm very happy for my fighters to not have to fight the legs too much like yep. if they happen to be in the same location great but otherwise i i found that the the fighters are dealing with the other spiders yeah more than not notably the the web spinners if up doom, yep. down, doom down right yep. so that, that's that makes one. sense yeah yeah and i think that i agree because you know it's it's one of those things where you look at this and you're like oh one clue for three damage that's crazy like one action for three damage but it also in theory takes an action to get the clue so it's kind of like you're spending two actions for three damage mm -hmm. like so I, I think it's pretty reasonable and also like there is no other use for clues so otherwise they would be completely useless mm -hmm. so yeah uh you know but it kind of goes to the story of like should your folks getting clues be able to do something else too and i think that's just not the purpose of this scenario i think they have a, an extra amount of health to be uh, damage to be dealt and that's the way they want you to deal it like and I, don't, also, yeah. I don't think of these as enemies like i think of them as spend three clues right <laughs> or, i guess that's fair. Is. yeah yeah per player clues mm -hmm. yeah and that makes sense um and uh yeah I, i'm pretty much agree um and i like the fact that it still is themed in a way where you're dealing damage because it, it does feel like this epic battle where everyone is participating mm -hmm. right but we'll come back to that a little bit when we see the enemies in the encounter deck too. And, and I think yes. that's part of the story. Uh, let's then uh, defeat all the legs. Sure. All right. The Queen's Wrath. So we get rid of its legs and uh, the center bit kind of comes out and uh, a lot of screeching going on. So these four are in the victory display at this point. So let's move those out. Thank you. There you go. And we get... Athlock Naka, the Spider Guard, it spawns at the location with the most doom on it, so you can go either there. Uh, it is nice that if there is a tie, you do get to choose, which can be very handy. Yes. So when does this happen? Is it at the end of the round, or is it whenever you... It's whenever it's just you whenever, whenever they're defeated. Okay, so yes. try not to do this if you've played <laughs> the this a the second round. time uh, when it's about to attack you, because that's bad. Yes. All right, yeah, so let's look at this enemy. Athlock Naka, the Spider God, four fights, four per investigator health, four evade, ancient one, spider elite, massive. Forest, when it leaves the location, if there are no investigators at the location, place a doom there. Otherwise, it attacks each investigator at that location. Forest, it has the same evade effect where you can't exhaust it the entire way. Only one person is evaded at a time, effectively. Mm-hmm deals two and two so this is the hard part <laughs> this is um, a pain <laughs> yes so let's also read the act because this is very important yep so we still have the action to spend the clue to deal three damage notably this enemy does no longer say that it cannot make attacks opportunity so if you do do that it will attack you first unless it's exhausted somehow mm -hmm. and then it has the same force effect where at the beginning of the mythos phase you reveal a random token but this time it moves clockwise x times instead of rotating clockwise x times and uh all we got to do is defeat it easy it's only has easy, four easy. per player health yeah and mm. then we draw a minus four and then it goes one two three four it puts one two three four doom down or maybe attack someone that was here right? yep. that's the whole thing about this yeah right? it's that that's really rough <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> um well here's the thing about that it, this is why I say that the scenario is so swingy. Is like if you draw the minus four, that can happen. Yep. And then you are forced to spend your whole turn running after it, or waiting and just getting more doom as it comes back around, which is probably awful. Like yeah. putting that much doom around if there aren't investigators at its location, or if just taxi, which just probably kills you anyway. If you do that too many times, um, 
that just takes you out of the scenario. Now, if you draw a zero, you're good. There's nothing. Now you can actually try to fight it and maybe take it out in one turn because, you know, four per player isn't uh, actually that ridiculous. Not that bad. No. The tough part is getting to her. Yeah. And I don't know. Like, there's a lot of locations here. And if you just <laughs> pick the wrong token out of the bag, especially if this is, you know, a couple of rounds, um, you know, if you happen to be on one side and it, and you're not even you're waiting for her to come over to you anyway, I don't know. It's like there's nothing you can do, right? There's no no plan really for this part of the scenario. Plan is to be lucky. Yeah, <laughs> that is the plan. <laughs> not to mention anything else that might be happening. Um, Indeed. But let's take a look at the agenda flip since we haven't seen those yet. Yes. So let's assume that we have two players. So we have eleven doom on the first one. Mm -hmm. When this flips, all we do is an encounter deck reshuffle, which, by the way, there are ancient evils in this game, mm -hmm. in this scenario. So that's fun. This one has nine plus two plus that nine plus two per player, so this would be thirteen. Mm -hmm. um, but as a reminder, we don't remove doom, so it's kind of inflated there. Yep. And then I believe the same thing happens here. It's just an encounter deck reshuffle, and this one is eleven plus two per player, so fifteen technically. Yeah. So I've had this go where. I flip to agenda two and then like maybe a round or two later because wow. of that, this one flipped. That's rough. I don't think I've ever gotten it that bad, but again, it's very swingy. Like it could have been that I was just on this side of the fence and never mm -hmm. like got, you know, uh, piled driven driven that far down. Right? Don't forget this location here has all the doom from the beginning of the scenario right. too. <laughs> yeah. So, and again, that's part of the thing where it's like just do better at the previous scenario or whatever, right? Sort of. So, so there's also hard. I mean, this might be a good time just to bring out the web spinners. Yeah. So these I think are the scariest enemy in the encounter set. And there's three of them, right? Yep. But let's just bring them all over. Let's uh, do it. So they spawn and the two 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 part is obviously not anything. Uh, nope. The spawn, any empty location, and aloof is the part that it is a two action tax just to get to them to be able to attack them unless you have other uh, engagement or movement tech. Yep. And then at the end of the round, if it is ready, so always, or if you, I guess if you uh, use the uh, if you use the it, disguise the, or something or slip yeah, away. Yeah, the the cheap trick. Is that it? No, that's not. That just damage and there's the one that it, like you inv you evade it twice. Yeah, slip right. away. <laughs> yeah, slip slip away. That's it. Okay, uh, which you probably don't want to do, but I guess <laughs> I guess not. You could. Um, anyway, yeah. It, basically, if you happen to draw this and it's going far away, because remember at this point, well, in, in the first act, you know, you just want to make sure it can't drop on the bottom location. In the second act with the four legs, there's a lot four fewer uh, empty locations, so you don't have as much choice there. Yep. Like, in theory, if you are in between two legs, it's a minimum of two locations away from you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and then in this look, this time, I don't even know if you can deal with these guys. At cause... this point, you ignore them and try to kill out the clock as fast as you can. <laughs> exactly. And then that uh, you eat an extra doom, I guess. Yeah. Um, so... Like I, I, I mean, I, I know I'm like overly negative about all of these like bad things happening, but they've happened to me, and it just feels kind of bad. So last time I played this, it was a three-player group, and we grabbed one of these with Zoe's weakness. Oh God! And I think I might have had overzealous or something, and picked up one in also in the upkeep phase. Oh no! And it just turbocharges the way this one goes, and it was like, well, yeah. what do you want me to do? <laughs> <laughs> Um, like Hank's weakness here is also pretty bad, right? I guess so. I'll be it. Hopefully, you could kill it in one shot without having to it move away. But yeah, at least it only yeah. goes to the connecting location. Yeah, uh, but the Zoe's being the furthest one away is uh, extra annoying, I think. But yeah, I mean, there there's tech for that stuff, right? There there's definitely ways to get rid of aloof enemies, but um. I've even seen this with like a Tony Morgan who should theoretically be able to take them out. The the point about these being, I think, also tough because of that force effect is if you fail the, the attack for whatever reason, right? An mm -hmm. auto fail or a bunch of curses or something, you've it's it's a big problem. Mm -hmm. Just don't fail. 
It's no fail. But th that's why I think this one just can spin out of control through these sort of small things. And that's kind of how I feel about the campaign in general. Like there's a lot of things that can compound without giving you much of a chance to uh, catch up. Like in a, I'll go into this more later, but like in a traditional eight scenario campaign, there could be some, some scenarios that you just don't do well in, but they usually balance those out where there's some time to make up XP or other things. Anyway. Uh, yeah, so this one is like maybe 15 or who knows what it actually would be based on how you're, uh, d dropping doom all over the place. And then, uh, yep. this advances, then you're done, right? Yep. Yeah. R2. Okay. And then this one, if you defeat yep, her. If yep. We got R1. Yay. Uh, we win. Okay. Uh, let's look at the resolutions. Sure. So. If everyone dies, everyone dies. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds about right. The bridge was completed. R1, the bridge was destroyed. Gets a bonus XP. And uh, we uh, resolved the topmost option that applies. So if the investigators found a way out of the underworld, which was in order to do that, you had to go to the Tower of Koth and get the thing and whatever. Uh, you go to R3. Um, if you're trapped in that Thugnaka's realm, so that was the plaque that did not know the truth and Randolph Carter was alive, you go to R4. Otherwise, you go to R5. Mm -hmm. And uh, R2 is... Uh, the bridge is completed and everyone dies. Yep. Okay. So if you found the way out, you go to R3 and you record that you returned to reality. Good job. If uh, R4, so uh, you were trapped, well, you never escaped and uh, everyone's driven insane. And I think the last one is, yeah, you're just still in the dreamland. So it's not, you're not trapped, but you're in the dreamlands. And uh, you might be able to visit some friends again, but we'll see. Mm-hmm. We'll do the epilogue the campaign. later, but yeah, that's this campaign. Yeah. Let's check out the rest of the encounter cards here. Let's do it. So we put the web All spinners right. back here. So to reminder that there's just another spider uh, caught in the web is new. Yes, it is. So you put it in play in the third area. You get minus one, eva uh, minus one agility. Cannot take more than one move action each round. And as an action, test three combat to discard it. This can get kind of annoying. Mm-hmm. You can, I mean, it's one of these things where you're like, I'm not going to deal with this. Yeah. And then you're like, I should have dealt with this. <laughs> yeah. If you can, right? Like, imagine you're trying to move a location just to um, do another, you know, fight and kill an enemy. And then later you say, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. And we got endless weaving. Revelation, choose a spider enemy in play. If it's engaged with an invest, this is actually a complicated card, if I remember. It is. If it is engaged with it, okay, well, okay, sorry, let me start over. Choose a spider enemy in play. So obviously this could be web spinners, mm -hmm. spider of legs, swarm of spiders, gray weavers. It could also be the legs of Atlagnaka or Atlagnaka herself because mm -hmm. they're all spiders. So just keep that in mind. If it is engaged with an investigator, it attacks them along with all of its host cards or whatever. If it's not engaged with an investigator, you put a doom on its location. And it just, if there are no spider enemies, you just find one in the encounter deck and draw it. So ultimately, no matter what, you're either putting a doom down or it attacks uh, everyone? No. No. Okay, if it's engaged. So I guess if it was massive, it would hit everyone, right? Yes, but you don't put a doom if there's no spiders in play, which is rare, but... Correct. Yeah. So basically, you can't just be like, oh, all the legs are out, but no spiders, so you just go find a spider. You have to choose one of the spiders in play, the mm -hmm. legs, and put a doom on the location. Minimum. All or, right. Or an attack, but you know. All yeah, or, or an attack, of course. There's. It's nice to have some choice here. I mean, ultimately, you probably don't want to get hit for like three damage or something. Right. But one and one for the spiders is fine. Yeah. You don't really want to choose loser. these guys because they're probably not engaged with anyone. Yep. True. And yeah, these guys would be pretty bad. But <laughs> all right. Uh, all this right, is also this... new. Yep, the Spinner in Darkness, only in Acts 2 and 3, of course. You attach it to the nearest Ancient One enemy. It gets plus one damage and plus one horror. That's the damage and horror that it deals to investigators. Mm -hmm. And you can test any skill of five as an action to discard it. Um, so I've usually found that I've gotten kind of lucky with these, that I'm able to put them in the legs. Like, if you draw this while you're dealing with Atlaknaka herself, that's really bad. Yep. Terrible. Um, <laughs> but if you draw it with the legs, you like put one, you put it on one of the legs you're about to kill, and you're like, okay, we get it off. Don't have to just don't have to test anything, right? 
Yes. Um, yes. Also, the worst thing is that the action to test is not a parlay of any kind, so you'll take an attack, attack of opportunity if you, if you have to do that. Um, but not from the legs. Not from the legs, exactly. Yeah, I, I agree that this is usually... If you get it on the legs, it's fine. It, otherwise, I mean, you could, you could even stack these up on the same leg, right? Exactly, yeah. Uh, but if you get it on, on the final form, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, it is, I think that this one, this one is, this is one of the cards where in Act 2, you're like, thank God I drew this, because it kind of feels like a dead card sometimes, so that's mm -hmm. nice. I agree with that. Of course, once you do defeat a leg, this will go to the discard pile, and it can reshuffle back in with the, uh, agenda flip, so. True. And I think the Act oh. Flip too, or did that just shuffle these in? Uh, it just shuffles them in, although I don't know about the second Act Flip. Uh, the second Act Flip does not shuffle anything, so they don't only do through the agenda. Okay. All right, we got our regular spiders, the spider of laying and the swarm of spiders. Um, we already we've seen these before, mm -hmm. and uh, then we got the sickening webs, which I think is actually very annoying in this scenario. Yes. Uh, um, so unlike the first time we saw it, which I think is, it, it, I wouldn't say like soft, but um, yeah. this time since everything is a spider, basically, yeah, yikes, and you cannot move, right? Yep. So your plan about let me move and kill something like a web spinner yikes yep test those stats and we got some bigger spiders so we got the gray weavers five health kind of annoying in this time when you also have to deal with a bunch of other enemies and mm -hmm. the big ones and then you can't move um, you it, can't move when it's ready kill it. yeah yep. or be it, yeah and then we have the will of the spider mother spider spider mother um you cannot attack or investigate if you fail this and uh, you can't commit cards to this if there's a spider at your location which is fairly likely mm-hmm and uh, you need to do those things. So, yeah. Pass them. At least the spending the clues for damage is not either of those. Mm -hmm. That's so, true. you can get kind of lucky, but otherwise, yeah. Uh, these two are <laughs> soft. <laughs> In comparison, of. I guess, yeah. definitely obscuring fog. Yeah. Uh, Obviously, Crypt Chill is Crypt Chill, but. Yep. And then Ancient Evils is very rough here. Yes. I don't know. I don't think the encounter deck is that soft i think that there are a couple where you're like okay i'd rather draw the swarm of spiders than something else but i think that all of these things are doing a great job of slowing you down and that is i guess so i i am seeing it now i think that like mm, i don't know um like the nice thing about the gray rivers is they have victory so they will never come back if you defeat them mm -hmm. and like the the web spinner is basically, it's not an enemy you have to deal with. It's an enemy you have to go go and fight. So the only, like, quote-unquote real enemies are these ones. And, like, the swarm of spiders ideally should not be a problem. So, yeah, like, I always find that I usually have enough damage output in order to do this. And it really depends on the cadence in which you draw, like, these Grey Weavers, for example. Because mm -hmm. they can kind of put a wrench in your plan, but I don't know. I, I, I mean, again, if things line up poorly like you're stuck in a location with the the legs and you need to fight you know this so people can move to get to the next location or something or you're you know now stuck in a location where at the end of uh, the investigation phase you're gonna have to drop doom you know you don't want to do these things but the game is kind of forcing you to make to choose between some some bad options it's true um again if you don't actually see the web spinners until you know, or maybe you only see them at the beginning, it's not that big of a deal at all. But you can kind of see how all of these cards really are um, conspiring, I think, t together. That's like fair. if you have the Spinner in Darkness, you draw this one first, and then you have to choose Endless Weaving, the spider enemy that is uh, has this attached. Well, I guess you don't have to, but you're choosing either maybe the one that uh, does two and two, or you're dropping a Doom, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, well... A lot of bad choices. Ultimately, though, I think it has to do with the... It's kind of predetermined. Like, if you don't have a whole lot of Doom on this location for whatever reason, then yeah. it's very manageable to take those uh, choices later. But if you are sitting here with, like, already four or five Doom for whatever reason... Mm, I don't know. Bring Moonlight <laughs> Ritual 2, I guess. Bring Janae. Yeah. She fixes all problems. <laughs> <laughs> she can fix some of those problems for sure. I think that moving the web spinner around maybe um, 
yeah uh, and also moving moving clues off move, the bad ones yeah moving very, clues very it, it would be very helpful here yeah uh but ultimately it is this sort of epic video game fight which i i very much enjoy the concept i just find it to be i've had tons of playthroughs where it's, it goes very well and you're like this feels really great and maybe not equal number but also a significant number of like well what did you expect was going to happen <laughs> <laughs> yeah and i think that that's probably the difference that i'm finding with our kind of overall opinions on this one because i feel like i rarely get that uh like the bad side of this but i can understand that there are a lot of forces that are conniving together to make that bad outcome happen and it's one of those things where it's like if one domino begins to fall it kind of is hard for you to stop everything from falling over mm -hmm. and that's just the i guess the whole purpose of the the doom staying on locations after the agenda flip yeah uh it, it's just funny to compare this to the forgotten age ones where there only um can be well there's only like usually two agendas but there's usually just one or two doom on locations is very mm. rarely more than that and i think in some cases there's abilities to get the doom off built into the uh to the scenario hey this one has that too yes and indeed it's part of the reason why i always put the cat here um all right so let's go through this we have the skulls which are a minus x x is the highest amount of doom on location in play again this is the one where it's swingy because the worst you're doing the worst what this one is mm-hmm Cultist, reveal another token. If you fail and there is an ancient one enemy at a location, it attacks you. Hopefully not so bad because it doesn't actually give a negative modifier, but obviously it can be bad. Uh, we have the tablets, which are a zero. The black cat tears at the web with its claws. If you succeed by two or more, remove one doom from your location. If you remember from uh, where the gods dwell, that one was just a zero and it did nothing. Yep. So this one's very nice to have. And uh, they, I think they knew that this one was harder than the other side, which makes sense. So you need some help here. But this is phenomenal. Every time that you can get this to go, it like drastically increases the chance you're going to of winning the scenario. Absolutely. Yep. If you can pull this off, especially on a location that has a lot of doom on it, then it also yeah. helps out the skull token. Exactly. And we How have do another you make that thing. happen? Okay. You know what you could do? You could play uh, Nikosi. Usually, <laughs> usually you're, you call like, skull or bless or curse or something but i could see calling the tablet for this one nikosi is familiar the black cat uh-huh love it that's so good all right and we have the elder thing minus three if the skill test fails during an attack during a spider enemy place a doom on this enemy's location once again it's more doom but ultimately it's not doing anything bad to you right now mm -hmm. um but obviously if you can avoid that that'd be good you know i'm morbidly curious what's the other side say yeah so let's see Next the amount of doom on locations play. <laughs> Holy shit. That's like, it could be like minus 12 or something. Yeah. Okay. Uh, reveal another token if you fail doesn't. That's same the same. Thing. Yeah. Tablet is just minus one now. And other things is minus four now. Okay. All right. It's just the skull. Remember, there's three yep. skulls at this point in this uh, part as well. <laughs> three more auto fails, it would seem. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, that's about it. I think we yep. could talk about the epilogue after we do the uh ratings for for this one sounds good all right let me go bring that up so i i'm not sure how i'm going to rate replayability here because the differences certainly are in the locations yep um but it's not quite like a, a different way of winning or something exciting they're just it's just randomness so you don't really know what to expect which i think is good good for the game um but ultimately i think most things are going to be similar in terms of the the gameplay it's just going to be like did we get screwed or, or are we very happy about the location arrangement yeah i agree um i think it's definitely more i think it's more replayable or maybe about the okay so basically I'm trying to think about if it is more or less or the same amount of replayability as um, Where the Gods Dwell. Mm -hmm. um, because obviously Where the Gods Dwell, the first half of it is literally the same. And then the second half is randomized based on the towers and then the encounter deck randomization on where you're getting Nyarlathotep and the Whispering Chaoses. That's right. And so this one has that, but also in spades, I think, because the location randomization does matter a lot. 
like you said before that like the arrangement of those locations where you can move across the map is really important the 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 uh, the, the location at the bottom of the of the staircase as it mm-hmm, were mm-hmm. um is really important too and you know it's not necessarily something where it like important as in like interesting but it is uh it definitely changes a lot of things which can make the scenario feel more replayable than perhaps it actually is i guess if that makes sense yeah um so i think with that in effect i gave the where the gods will i think a three um on replayability so i'll think that i'll give this a 3.5 i agree it's basically the same scenario each time but the locations really do matter and how the scenario plays out that makes sense to me too i will also give it a three and a half so let's go on to fairness um interesting and meaningful decisions for the players so yeah like there's a lot of as you said kind of tactics and you know making choices about what's better to to move or to stay here or can i should i wait um that kind of thing can i pass those tests once you reveal the locations i think it becomes more interesting in that respect um so i think i'd give it like high marks on just that part of the question what do you think about again just that part of the question yeah so meaningful decisions is interesting here because i do think that there are a lot of decisions that you need to be done and there's not the only issue is that there's not a lot of planning that you can do with those decisions. It's basically just you reacting the whole time mm-hmm. and trying to find open windows for you to actually uh, progress the objective where you're like, we finally got a downturn. Like maybe we drew not very many enemies, none at all, maybe. And like we've dealt with the web spinners. Let's go focus on trying to kill the legs right now and do as much as we can before everything goes downhill again. Um, and so it has this kind of cycle throughout the rounds where it's this push and pull between trying to manage everything that's coming at you and trying to actually progress the objective because Mm -hmm. you know because this isn't a clue focused scenario perhaps it means that everyone is just trying to contribute to one goal and the game is just trying to stop you from doing that or trying to accelerate the time limit for you doing that yeah Um, it is a very tight scenario in that in that sense right yeah i also think like thematically we'll get back to that later i suppose is that that uh, the way that you conceptualize this as like, what are the windows in which you have the opportunity to do something is really cool for the idea of you fighting this ancient one. It, it It's almost like, again, the video game analogy here of like, when, when is the, the, when is the boss going through the phase where you can actually attack it and you're kind of right. uh, figuring out what the, what the move sets are. The problem is usually in video games, there is a predictable, <laughs> yeah. pattern for when that happens yes and also there is a there's like time for you to learn the patterns and mm-hmm. or you can like restart in case you need to learn it more like if you're playing dark souls for example right? yeah exactly like, the whole point of that is supposed to fail a bunch to learn the patterns um but this one is very random in that sense and i speaking to the second point of the first sorry the second question of the first point mm-hmm. there are very little ways to mitigate the random elements in this one you are basically at the whim of what location is at the bottom of the staircase, what locations are in the ring, where they are, and like the amount of time that the real Athlak Naka moves. Because everything swings and hinges based on those. Um, and it's really hard to just be like, well, I drew a minus four, I guess we're putting four Doom down. Like, there's nothing you can do about that. Um, Even in so, hard, right? You you might have yeah. like a minus five or six or yeah. something and, else. Or you can draw a skull and you're like, well, that was minus eight. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, that's right. It's the met modifier of yeah. any of them. Yeah, and therefore that just ends the scenario right then. Because then it actually checks the doom right afterwards, right? Because right? yeah, at exactly. the beginning of the mythos phase. Yeah, that's kind of what um, I, I was... I forgot to mention that part when I said that the second... the Between the second agenda and the third one flipping, uh, it was partly because of that. It was just like, well, here's an extra for doom. Yeah. Well, I think that there there are interesting things to say on what like tiny tweaks could have made to make the scenario not as swingy mm-hmm. like maybe you do the rotation after the draw cards mythos phase the draw card step like the infestation test for example um maybe you uh maybe the athletic naka doesn't make attack opportunity right like there's a lot of things that could have been done um but we are kind of in the timeline where like everything is is very rough yeah just the swinginess between drawing a zero or even anything else right yeah yeah because you're if it's if it's well either even in your location or maybe like the next location the difference between you getting some attacks off and not is huge 
because it's going to you know, get another chance next time to move. And, and now, like, the more tokens you draw, probably the more likely that it's going to move at all. I had a thought, right? Mm -hmm. What if they, instead of relying purely on the negative modifier, it was like, it was always clamped between like one, two, or three always. And like, it roll it like, you know, like, like, if you draw a numerical token, it moves once. If you draw a symbol token, it moves two times. If you draw like an auto fail, it moves three times, or something like that, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like, if they were able to clamp it to those values, then it would be a lot more reasonable because then there would be a limit to how much it could move. And you could plan around that. And I actually like the idea of it moving at least once every round because then it does mean that it's always coming for you. Exactly. And you have to plan around that. But then you can also plan around that where you're like, I know it's going to be at least here in the next round. So that would be interesting. Yeah, I agree. Something where it's a, a slightly more predictable or at least the variance is not quite as much. Exactly. Um, okay, so with that in mind, um, so I'm just gonna I'm gonna put a little bit of my personal experience this into this. I don't think I've had that many negative experiences with this scenario, but that'll just be me. So I'm gonna put it at a three, trying to take into account all the things that we've talked about. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, we didn't sort of answer the last question, although it's been oh, wrapped sure. up in everything we've talked about. Um, how do you feel about ancient evils in this one? Yeah, I, well, okay, so. Honestly, I'm sometimes glad to draw it because it is a dead card sometimes. <laughs> um, and it is just nice because it's not like a... It's it's one of those cards where at this point it's like, I'm glad to draw it now because I'm not putting a Doom down on my location, at least. Right? Because that's like more permanent. That Ooh, that's true. That's yeah. very true. It's like the difference between that one Forgotten Age card um, that makes you decide about a vengeance or placing yeah. a Doom down. Ancestral fear. Yep. Um... Yeah, I think I agree with that. There is the whole encounter deck reshuffling issue, um, but it, it, because it's not the only source of doom in this scenario, I feel like it's almost forgettable. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's a funny way to put it. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, as far as like just answering the, the question as written, though, um, I, my only answer to that is like sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of variance, I think. Yeah. Uh, so you're going with two and a half? Three. Three. Okay. I think I'm going to put it at two. Okay. So I, I just wish that they gave you some agency and maybe they don't want you to, and that's just part of Arkham, but, yeah. um, it, it does feel like both of these finales have a little bit much on, you know, d uh, turned that dial a little bit higher than it probably should have compared to other finales, mm -hmm. but it is what it is. It is what it is. Um, this one's actually pretty good, right? I feel like there's a... I mean, agility is a little bit more important than usual. There is, yep. There's a couple of tough willpower tests, though, um, with the crypt chill and the locations. But I think that pretty much everyone is doing something and is useful. Yeah, I agree. It basically demands a lot from everybody, but it demands... A lot from everyone at the same time mm -hmm. um, and it, it is able to do that because it has this singular goal of defeating Atlak Naka and everyone is working towards that goal and so everyone kind of has to do that goal in different ways but mm -hmm. in 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 their own way evasion is a little bit worse just because uh you need to get rid of enemies and yep. it doesn't really stop the uh, ancient ones from completely well it doesn't stop Atlantica from moving for one uh and it only takes away one attack i mean it's useful if you can make it work but it's not really the, the strategy you want to bring into this side of the campaign i don't think i agree and the agility stat for this scenario can best be used for like the sickening webs or mm -hmm. those uh the you know the locations that make you test that etc etc yeah, but I'm probably not going to put, like, Mists of Relia into my, my deck here. Right. Compared to, like, I don't know, other campaigns where it might make the cut. That's just yeah. not I'll be. I mean, the free move is good, though. Yeah, but I'm not... Who am I evading, right? <laughs> yeah. Um. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, I'll put it at a four. Yeah, it sounds pretty reasonable. I will join you at four. Again, I do. After having played this enough, I really do feel like the clue thing is is fine. I don't want them to do that for every campaign, <laughs> but 
I I think that there's enough for the the fighters to do already. All right, the new and interesting gameplay loop is very new and very interesting, and it's an eight location loop. It is. <laughs> it is. This is. It's neat. I mean, again, I I love this whole caught in a giant spider web conceit where you're crawling around and trying to get from one end to the other chasing or being chased by the spider yeah and i think that what this campaign's strength has always been has been the fiction that it has been trying to evoke i think that this scenario in like it felt like it felt very top down where it's like we're having this epic fight with a spider how do we accomplish that with the locations and the enemies mm -hmm. and i think they really nailed it like Yes, you were talking about earlier about like, you know, this scenario feels very swingy and potentially that's like the point of it or like the, the intention. And I think that they were definitely intending it for this to be just very swingy because they want it to feel like there's this chaotic giant spider just like going all over the place and you have to like figure out what to do with this thing. And it's huge and then it eventually comes out in the middle and it just, you know, rampages across the webs and tries to kill you. And I think they really nailed the fiction here. And I also, I like anything they can do to just surprise me is really, really good. And I think that, you know, having the five legged spider thing is just really, really cool. Like, I will always give props for that because that's like, it's so good, I think. Um, yeah. And spinning it around on your table is a lot of fun. It is a lot of fun. I really want to just get a lazy Susan to play this. Yeah. <laughs> little mini lazy Susan. Um, yeah. So, with that in mind, uh, as I recall, I gave Where the Gods Will a four, a four and a half, uh, because of that beginning part of the scenario. This one, I think that the beginning part is actually appropriate, mm -hmm. and uh, I will give this a five, because I, I love the theme of this scenario. I'm right there with you. I think the beginning part is sort of necessary for uh, maybe learning a little bit about the locations yeah. and the basic mechanic of, of Doom. I mean, I, I do think that they could tone down the doom mechanic i'm not sure that's necessary for the idea um but i think that the whole epic boss battle taking up almost all of the uh the scenario and then this is not my final form <laughs> right <laughs> uh surprise at the end i think is is way better than the uh, other one where you might not ever see it yep which i kind of wonder like what the deal with that was but that's okay. I know that one is weird. I, I I'm actually genuinely curious on the percentage of our player base that has ever even beaten slash seen that last fight. Yeah. All right. Well, let's go ahead and talk about the epilogue, and then maybe some final thoughts about the 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 dream side, or sorry, the the web of web of dreams, and then the overall eight part campaign. Good. Okay. So I'll let you get us over here. So. We made some choices at the end of the last scenario in terms of, you know, if we were, um, well, not just necessarily choices, but based on how we finished the scenario. And that was true for the uh, dream side as well. Yes. So there are basically four outcomes for each side. On the uh, dream quest side, the invasion has begun as if we fail. Um, the dreamers awoke is the normal quote unquote ending. Um, Staying in the dreamless forever is if you decide to stay. And uh, travel beneath the monastery is if you. Um, learned more about the underworld. <laughs> is that right? <laughs> Something like that. I think so. Yeah. Um, and then the bridge is completed. Obviously, that's our failure for this side. Um, return to reality is normal success. Never escaped is if we succeeded, but we were trapped. And uh, still in the dreamlands is if we were um, able to... Uh... What is that one? Go through the trap door? That's right. That's if you find a way out. And... There is a very handy dandy matrix here of the four times four, 16 possibilities that will happen. Each one is fairly short. Uh, I don't know if we want to go through the whole thing, but basically kind of the main outcomes are either you, the investigators, the, there's an opportunity for both of you to meet in the dreamlands. There's an opportunity for the dreamers to get the other investigators out of the dreamlands because they were able to get them out. Um, but if you were stuck there, then you're stuck there. And if like the dreamers awoke and they were stuck there, then just never saw each other, you know, stuff like that. Um, yeah, it's kind of yeah. funny when they. I think you can lose the campaign or one side if you don't. Um, if you're separated, no, you always win if you're 
if you're uh, yeah if you're so okay yeah so for example epilogue one is like you you lost both of them so yes everyone loses yeah um the like the two three four and the one five nine thirteen are all like one of you did well the other ones didn't boohoo i think that's how that works yeah you um, averted one form of destruction but not the other yes exactly um yeah that's right um and then otherwise it's just about either you reunite in the dreamlands you're able to both survive but you're separated or you're able to uh both leave basically yeah i think that's right yeah uh and, and then of course <laughs> there is this little extra bit here of uh if you if you killed the cats of Ulthar, uh how dare you and uh they come back and kill you <laughs> yep good uh good flavor note there to end on yeah all right so what are your thoughts on the web of dreams as a whole yeah so web of dreams obviously as we've said is definitely the it's definitely the harder two harder of the two um than the uh dream quest and uh i think that it definitely has some of the better scenarios but also some of the worst scenarios if that makes sense <laughs> um like the dream quest i think is like fairly straightforward because mostly it's mostly a linear campaign where right? it's like you're going through here go through here yes there's the search for good death but it's basically the it's four linear campaigns that's four linear scenarios um this one feels more like it's like exploratory like that's the idea of it it's like waking nightmare you're exploring saint mary's hospital and uh the no you know when you're at the haunted house you have to explore the house when it's born and overturned you're exploring the the underworld um whereas the dream quest is very much like go 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 do the thing mm -hmm. um so i like that that there is a contrast between the two it definitely uh means that you can kind of have your pick on what style you prefer or when you're interweaving the campaigns it feels like you know it's a good break in between you're not strictly linear and then strictly exploratory either way um and i think that i actually like this finality be better than where the gods dwell um just because i think that having a final boss fight like this one is definitely a more traditional final boss fight as far as arkham is concerned because as far as the uh where the gods dwell is concerned you never quote unquote fight Nihilatotep, unless you're doing the secret ending, which is very rare, quote unquote, or like you have to choose to do that. So it kind of feels like it's not really a finale anyway. Like the the finale is more like I don't know, like a like a pre finale, if that makes sense. Um, which well, is why I always try to end the campaign on this scenario. Yeah, I agree with that. I, I think that there's a few other campaigns that are kind of that way. The what's the Forgotten Age one? Shattered Aeons is kind of that weird ending. There's no that's true boss except for the you know alejandro yeah or and Ishtaka, Ishtaka. Mm -hmm, or both and you're kind of just doing something else right while that's going on yeah i think that that one feels like that one to me feels better because it at least plays into the goal of the campaign because yes. it's about the relic of ages and you having to use it to restore the timelines and you know even though you're not going back in time to put it back, which is the, what the actual finale is. Um, it's still like, it's like thematically like the end of the movie where you're like, have to do all the stuff. Like the Nyra Lethotep fight feels more like, like a, like a midway fight. Like if not, like if, okay. So I think that's part of the reason why, why we haven't done it yet, because like, it kind of feels like this is like a prelude to like an actual full campaign with Nihilatotep, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so it doesn't feel like this is the end of Nihilatotep because it isn't. Um, so it's one of those things where it's like, you know, in, in Arkham, we always like to have this like, you know, final boss fight. And so this one feels like an actual final boss fight, if that makes sense. The other part that I think makes it feel better is that the spiders are there the entire campaign. Yes, that Out, is true. Outside of a thousand chips of horror, there are spiders in the other three. So it feels like a culmination of your investigation that started in a spider infested hospital. Yeah. The I also dream think that, side, I don't, I mean, we yeah. talked about that last time. It's like, why are you here? Who knows? Exactly. And I think that's part of it is that like the story of the dream side is like a linear railroad of exploring the dreamlands and eventually getting to Kadath, but it's all about leading up to Randolph Carter's betrayal. Whereas this one, it's like it feels like there's much more motivation because like they're stuck in the dreamlands, help them out. Oh, we've ran into the spider things. Oh, something's going on that's trying to invade 
the material plant or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so we have to fix that, right? So it feels like much more of a classic Arkham uh, plot line, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes the the campaign feel a little bit more cohesive. But I, I agree yeah. with your, your other comments about how the two campaigns are kind of different. And interlacing them, I suppose, is neat. Um, I've never done it any other way. I mm -hmm. usually, I mean, in terms of just playing one half or the other, but sometimes I've been just going like A, B, B, A, A, B, B, A. Yeah. To not have to, you know, move the chaos bag around too much. <laughs> yeah, I've only ever done one half one time, um, and it was just the A side. Um, and it was honestly nice and it was like a relaxing time <laughs> where you could kind of just like lay back, kind of just be Bob Jenkins and play three Aeon charts in one turn. And, uh, <laughs> Fantastic. It was a nice time. So, you know, it was a very low stress environment, I guess. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I probably enjoy this one better, but I, you know, I, I don't really enjoy the Dream Eaters overall yeah. as an experience. Um, I kind of alluded to this earlier, but the eight scenarios broken up into two investigators that you're playing, uh, meaning that you only upgrade your decks three times is rough to me I, th I think that for i mean I, I play a lot of arkham so like the whole idea of uh remembering what each of your decks are doing is not that big of a deal but i think for people who don't play that often and maybe only play once every two weeks uh it might be that only once a month they see their investigator that uh that they're playing right and remembering how they play is maybe something that they don't e easily do yeah, I think that this one definitely it appeals to perhaps like perhaps we are not the target audience for this one because I think that it part of the selling point of this one generally or at least it feels like is that hey this one contains two campaigns mm -hmm. um, and therefore you have the option to play one or the other. Of course, we as people who've played this game a lot are like no, of course you're playing the whole thing the whole time, and therefore we will deal with switching investigators and chaos bags the whole time. But I'm sure that many people are just like, oh yeah, let's just play Dream Eaters A this time, and then next time we'll play Dream Eaters B, and like we don't need to see the things in between, because it's like, we don't need to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and so it definitely is a, appeals to a certain audience, I think. And I do hear a lot of people ask for shorter campaigns, because eight scenarios can be a bit of a commitment for, for some groups. So exactly. I, I do see that. Um, however, just in my experience of playing this one a lot, I think it the campaigns get a lot more swingy the shorter they are because if you get behind at the beginning, you really stay behind and it's harder for you to catch up where, with where the uh, campaign expects you to go. So a lot of, or to, to be in any individual scenario. So like the very first scenarios uh, for both of these gave out what 13 and 12 max XP. Yeah, and I'm not gonna say it's easy to, um, you know, get all of it or or to uh, miss out on a huge chunk of it either, because it should be relatively friendly in the the first scenario. It's certainly the the beyond the gates of sleep, uh, but you know the these two VP locations that were in those first couple scenarios, if you if something happens where you did like just leave one clue behind because you know if you don't do that you're gonna die or something. Yeah. Or, or someone drops clues there and dies, whatever. Like the difference between two XP or no XP on a single location, I think hits harder in a campaign that doesn't really let you catch up. True. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, so I don't know. That's just something I've noticed playing this one more recently too, where uh, sometimes things go well and you're like, wow, that was easy. And then sometimes they go bad and you're like, is the finale even winnable at this point? <laughs> Yeah, and I've never felt that with any other campaign. I've always felt like you can, well, while the first uh, scenario is always the most important, I think, for giving you a good head start, there's usually a few scenarios that you can, I'm not going to say bomb, but you can afford to not uh, completely clear. And that's okay, because the next scenario you can maybe pick up some of what you lost. And then here, there's just, there isn't another scenario for you to pick up your, your pieces. That's true. So... I I like the overall experience, like the theme for all of these, I think is quite strong and, and fun. Um, but I also want to see these as eight in an eight part campaign. I want to see what they would have done, especially with the, the dream side. Yeah. I wonder if it would be, you know, 
with the story they wanted to tell, definitely things would need to change, I think. Like, either the additional scenarios would have to, like, you know, take apart bits of the other scenarios to be able to, like, expand them. Mm -hmm. Or, like, you know, having basically, like, come up with four new scenarios that are, like, brand new, do brand new things um, that, like, are, like, interesting in their own right. Uh, because the story they want to tell is also, like, it does feel truncated because it's this length. And I think that's the point of it, is that, like, it's a nice, like, digestible amount, not, like, a huge amount. Um, so, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I rambled for a bit. What's your overall take on the, the campaign as a whole? Yeah, so I think this one is interesting because this one this one was my least favorite after my blind playthrough. And that was because I wasn't interested in the story. Mm -hmm. um, I think this is definitely like probably just a me problem, if anything, um, just because it didn't like I'm not like too interested in the actual stories of any of the campaigns that much. I mean, like I am, but like this one did feel like especially the dream, the dream side. It definitely felt like I was on rails um, and it, it definitely felt like, you know, all of this lore that we're learning with the dreamlands is like interesting for a certain person. And that was not me. And I was like, yep. Okay, we get it. We're going to get another sign of the gods. Okay, let's move on. Um, <laughs> and uh, I I personally more are more appealed when the story and the like campaign mechanics are like interwoven really well. And that's when I'm like, okay, I want to learn more about the story because it will affect gameplay. And this one, like, it doesn't do that really. It's just you're going through the story and then you're at the end. Um, that being said, I think that some of the more really creative stuff that they do in this campaign is really good. Like, I love this finale, as we talked about, with the whole spinning spider thing. I also really like the Nihilus that's fight in general, like the whole hidden card thing. I just, mm -hmm. I think it's just like a really interesting choice. And like, I love it when the finales are able to just go wild. Like, I love that one. Like, you know, for all the, you know, for all the stuff about like the, like the Edge of the Earth finale or the, the, not, okay, maybe not the Scarlet Keith finale because there's also the hidden scenario. Um, but like, you know, the Circle and Dunn finale and like the Carcosa finale where they're able to just go, they're just like, do all the weird stuff. And like, yes, it works, it, but it still works with the campaign that they brought up because, you know, the familiar encounter sets are still here. But like, add the weird thing, do the weird thing. <laughs> and like, yep. the finale, like, this one has two finales and therefore they're able to do two weird things. And I really appreciate that. That's true. It is neat to have two finales in in the campaign and uh i wonder like if i kind of wish that there was like extra paths in the campaign because there really isn't right yeah. there's there's very little player agency uh, maybe that's my my biggest uh annoyance here with the swinginess of the scenarios is like a lot of it is like okay well it, it's happening out of my control but i wonder if they could have done something with randolph carter maybe there's story reasons why they couldn't but if they could have had some way to um choose which is the real randolph carter yeah you know maybe yeah. on certain playthroughs it's on one end on other playthroughs it's the other kind of like siding with uh each taka or alejandra but you know maybe spice that up in some way yeah i mean like imagine a campaign where like the beginning of the campaign is like like flip a coin and we'll reveal what that means at the end right mm -hmm. like that'd be really cool um this this is like the um, the Scarlet Key scenario with the with Desi, right? Um, yep, yep. That that one is that's the one that reminds me. Which, by the way, that scenario is really cool. I, not even that scenario, but like the outcome of that one. Yeah, um, and I'm sure we'll talk about that. But so yeah. uh, there, the twist that you know neither Randolph is your friend is okay. Um, but you know, I, I think they could add some replayability if that wasn't the case. And you know, I think uh, MJ herself on Twitter said that like. There were plans in the return two to do some really wild stuff, so maybe this is just a sad that the return twos are gone moment. Mm -hmm. That maybe we could have seen really an expansion on what this could have been. I didn't get to make the joke the other time we recorded, but there is no return to point of no return. <laughs> that would be an amazing scenario name. <laughs> the the scenario just doesn't exist. You that's, just can't do it. That's why There's they no canceled return the return twos. They are like that's, exactly. <laughs> we're done. Yeah. So, all right. Well, I think that's a good wrap on the Dream Eaters, and I hope that you've, uh, you know, stuck with us throughout this, and, and maybe you've uh, picked up this campaign recently and are playing it. 
and having a fun time with it. I think um, it's still a great addition. I, I I do rank it towards the bottom of my overall interest in which campaign to randomly play, and I, I've replayed it the least, but it's still one that I want to play. Like, there's no campaign. I, I've read what people say randomly on, on Reddit when not all the time people say, Never play this one again, you know, referring to some campaigns. I don't feel that way about this. No, campaign. all campaigns are worth playing mm-hmm. at least once, if not multiple times. Yep. Uh, I definitely recommend um, the player cards. And certainly a lot of the uh, scenarios are, are interesting and fun. And it makes it my regular rotation. I, I don't know how I feel about the uh, lack of return twos at this point, too, because that also means that I probably play these campaigns less the um edge of the earth the, to some extent but for sure yeah scarlet like this keys, this one in this one in insmith for sure yeah as you say for sure scarlet keys and hemlock veil ha- have built-in replayability yeah uh edge of the earth somewhat uh but yeah this one and, and um insmith really could use the uh the boost from a return to but that's where we are right now anyway in 2024 all right. Well, thank you as always, Super Fang, uh, for chatting with me. And uh, I always enjoy your insight and other experiences on on these uh, scenarios and campaigns, especially this one. I mean, I I guarantee you, if I talk about this one again in like a year after having played it a few more times and it, having smooth sailing, I'd be like, "This <laughs> one's great. It's totally balanced. There's totally balanced. <laughs> totally balanced. Just get good. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, yes. Yeah. That's- it- Part of why we don't review these until you know we've played them a number of times to sort of get a variety of uh, experiences because you may have played this once and it goes really well or really bad and hard to know if that is typical or just you know uh, on the end of the bell curve. So uh, that'll do it. We'll see you for more reviews in the future. Goodbye.